All right, good morning. So we know that the power of being grateful, uh, but sometimes it's hard to remember to give thanks. I did something similar to this a couple weeks ago. I'm just going to do it better. I hope. It can be easier to take what life and what God has given us on a daily basis for granted. Um, God sometimes does give us lemons and expects us to make the best lemonade we've ever drank in our life. But most people will look at that lemon and just go, oh man, that's bitter and it makes my eyes water and it makes me squint. But see, God sees things differently than we do. God sees that we need nourishment for the body, we need nourishment for the, for the brain, but he also knows we need nourishment for the soul. So God does things and gives us opportunities to give nourishment to us so that we can praise him. And it's quintessentially important that we always praise God. Those blessings come. That is God's covenant to us. That if we do for him, he does for us. No questions asked. He just does. Remember, I keep preaching, put a guy, a smile on God's face when he's not expecting it. That's the best thing you can do. And, you know, we get so wrapped up in our lives. We get so wrapped up in hardships and challenges and struggles that it's easy to get lost in the sea of doom called life. We look at what pe other people have and we go, I want, I want, I want. I, I just want to tell you something. <laughs> If you want, 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 get up off your lazy butt and go try to get, 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 and give God the praise, the glory, and, and pray to Him and say, God, this is what I would like to have. If God sees you putting in the effort and He believes it's your will and you'll do right with it, that's exactly what's going to happen. But you've got to make the initiative. God can give you something. And then you sit on your laurels. You sit on your butt. You know, I've always said this about people. You ever heard the expression of armchair quarterback? Yeah, it's one of these guys that do this, eating their chips and their dip and they're drinking those 12 ounces and they put them down they go, well, I can't believe he didn't throw that ball at 30 yards, that guy was wide open. I look at that and go, you know, he had like one-tenth of a second left before he, before he was going to get hit by a 350-pound lineman that was going to try to bury him into the turf. So everybody's got an opinion on something because they've never lived in that position to actually have to do something. So there's all kinds of armchair and couch quarterbacks out there that want to give everybody else an opinion how to live their life, how to do with with their life. But the greatest quarterback of all time is God. The greatest artist of all time is God. And I've said this a million times. I thank God, and I literally do, daily for a lot of things. But I still can't fathom in my brain how gracious God was to make North Carolina and then make the rest of the world around it. By the way, we beat Florida State last night at Florida State. Go Tar Heels. People that don't know me, I'm a huge college basketball fan. For people of faith, including Christians, positive blessings do come from God. And people will say, well, you know, I was getting blessed. And then it kind of slowed down to a stop. And then we got little trinkles of blessings. And then I'm just waiting for the big blessing. Well, God's waiting for that covenant of joy. God is waiting for everything that He wants. And then the blessings from heaven are going to pour down like rain. And you're not going to know what to do. There is not going to be enough five-gallon buckets to catch the rain blessings that God's going to bestow upon your life. You have to be willing to do it. And sometimes that takes sacrifice. Sometimes that takes doing things that not necessarily you want to do, but you know it's for the betterment of yourself, your family, and the people around you. Amen? I've always said this. You guys know I was in pro wrestling. I remember getting hit in the head with a chair. Uh, this is in the Louisville Gardens. And uh, I went through the ropes, and I'm going to give away a secret. I was supposed to take three steps through the ropes and turn and put my hands up so I could block a little, because those chairs are actually real. 
It's like I blocked a chair. I went through the ropes. I took two steps and got whacked. I didn't get to block my hands or nothing. And I had blood just pouring down my face. I mean, it just slashed me open. And I remember going backstage and they said, well, you know what, Johnny, this is what we can do. I said that we can take you to the hospital, get you a couple stitches, but you're going to miss tomorrow night. Now, back in the day in wrestling, you didn't get paid if you missed. You had to do it, right? So I thought, there's got to be something else I can do to get my paycheck for tomorrow night. So I asked the guy, I said, you got any super glue? And he said, yeah. And I said, just shave a little spot right there, and I still got the knot, and just super glue it shut so I can work tomorrow night. I worked the next night with a super glued head shut. Because God put me in the place I didn't know where I was, but it was either going to do the next thing or sit back and go, it's too painful. I had a mild concussion. I was throwing up. I was dizzy. And I had super glue in my head, cutting open a gash about that big and about that deep. But I looked at that even back then, and I thought, by initiative, I want to do this again because it's, it's going to better me down the road. So I overcame that pain, got super glued, and drove 260 miles to Little Rock, Arkansas, and did a show the next night. So I don't like people complaining about, I don't want to. A lot of parents do things for their kids that they don't want to. Newsflash. Do you think he really wanted to put him on a cross? Do you not think that was painful for him? He had to for the betterment of everybody else. And any parent that is in this room that isn't willing to sacrifice everything for their children isn't much of a parent, are they? That goes the same way with God. God wants to see everybody do their best whenever they can and however they can. And if you're one of those ones that sit back and go, I don't want to. I'll tell you something right now. I don't want you around me because I don't want you bringing me down because I've got the Spirit of God going through me telling me that I can. And you should have that in your mind, body, and soul that you can. You cannot have quit inside of your body. And I preached this, and anybody that was in Nashville Friday night, nope, Thursday night, I, I gave a little impromptu service about a little five or six minute thing. And I said what I say up here to them, and it's going to air on, on AIM Christian Television. I said, anybody not willing to take a chance and jump off that ledge knowing that God's going to catch them, if you don't take that chance, folks, you're a coward. Because you can't have the faith the size of a mustard seed the Bible teaches us about. You can't have the faith that no, if you fall off that cliff, you might get a little bruised, but you're not going to die. You might get a learning lesson out of it. That's called life. That's called getting up and being able to tell people that at least you tried. You know, if, if what would have happened if Benjamin Franklin didn't put a key in a jar on a kite and let lightning hit it? What would have happened if the if technology is this way? What would have happened if all the people that built the things that God allowed them to have the ability to build went, eh, no, eh, I'll let somebody else do it. We today could still be 15 to 20 years behind in technology because somebody didn't. They could have and they didn't. And then you know what those same people do? They sit in a bar and they go, man, I thought of that 10 years ago. Now that guy's a multimillionaire and I'm, I'm buying black label on, you know, at the bar because it's the cheapest at a dollar a bottle, right? You could have been the guy drinking Dom Perignon going, man, can you believe that this happened? Or you could actually be the guy not in a bar at home drinking a Coca-Cola and praying to God and telling him, thank you for allowing me and letting me have this idea, but also thank you for giving me the courage to go out on a ledge and, and do what I knew I could. Amen? So, God's love, presence, inspiration, and influence are the reasons why we have reminders in the Bible about giving thanks to God. These Bible verses are about being grateful, but they're also about trying to strengthen your faith. And 
You are every single day of your life, if not every day, frequently, you are going to come across a bump in the road. Folks, that's just called living life. Everything isn't going to go your way. Ever. But if you pray, a lot of the things that were going to happen won't. And a lot of things that do happen will be lesser of. Amen? So pray on your good days. Pray with your good news. Pray when things aren't going the way that you want it. Knowing that God is going to answer your prayer and that bump in the road is not going to last. Amen? Thessalonians 5, 16, 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thank, thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ. Now, there is good news in that scripture. The good news is God actually does want you to be happy. He wants you to pray to him. And he also wants you to be thankful to him every day. How do you be thankful to God? It's real easy, folks. It's just like this. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for the faith I have. I'm going to try to do better. I repent my sins, those that I know about and those that I don't know about. And I want to be a new creature today. I want to be a new creation today. I want to be the best me today that I can be. See, God, if you repent with a pure heart like King David did, God isn't going to look at your past and go, well, you know, I'll forgive you for everything except for that. Because, you know, that was a little crazy. You know, you're going to have to do a little more repenting than you're just this. See, if you repent with a pure heart, and God knows that moving forward, you're going to be that new, per new person that 2 Corinthians 5.17 uh, teaches, it, that you'll be a new creature, a new creation in Christ. If God knows this and your repentance is pure heart, God just tells you to walk, he, he welcomes you back home. He welcomes you back into the loving grace of a loving Christ. Amen? And then you're quintessentially His. You're loved. I know, I like that word. 2 Corinthians 4.15 All of this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow in the glory. Now I'm going to read that one again. All of this is for your benefit. You may look at it as a punishment. You may look at it as a curse. You may look at it as like something you don't want to do. You may look at it as like, eh, okay. Has anybody in here ever been blessed, 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 like abundantly blessed? And then all of a sudden, what, ha what I said in the beginning starts to happen. The blessings get less. The big one you were waiting for isn't there yet. Or the, the blessings start, somebody told me this this morning, the blessings just start trickling in. You ever, you ever been in that position in your life where the blessings just seem to stop for a minute? And it says, all of this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more can cause thanksgiving to overflow with the glory of God. Sometimes God waits for you to do something outstanding for Him. And then He will open up the heavens, He will remove the clouds, and He will look down on you, He will put His hand on you, He will put His hand on your children, your family, and everyone around you, and he will say, this is not only the blessing that I promised you, but this is the blessing that is more abundant than what I promised you. Amen? Corinthians 3.15 Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as a member of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. The good news about that is that there are two traits all Christians should have. They should have peace in their hearts, and they should always have gratitude towards God. If we can find peace in our hearts to love one another, this world changes today. If we have uh, the ability to find forgiveness in our hearts, this world changes today. And if we can find the ability to make sure that we give gratitude towards God, all people, all races, Regardless of status, regardless of economic status, regardless of even what denomination you are, if we can find today to give gratitude towards God, this world 
changes today. So let's be the start and let's saddle this thing up and change the world today. Philippians 4, 6, 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of your God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. You guys want to hear something funny? You know I have to use these, right? I can see this paper right now as clear as a bell. I just read that, and there's no way I should be reading that without these glasses. That's the truth. You want to see how thick they are? Tell me if I should be able to read a piece of paper without those on. Yeah. Amazing. Good news. Well, I'll read this without my glasses. Rather than praying when you're worried about a specific situation, make sure to pray continually so that you're, that you're blessed every day. And that worried situation doesn't even come because you've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed. So if you pray about a situation, if you're praying prior to that situation, you may not have to. It may not show up because God's blessing you because of your prior prayers. Amen. 1 Corinthians 16, 34. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. I'm just going to put these up. Um, the good news is, God's love is the only thing that will last forever. These earthly bodies are going to die. I did a sermon about 10 or 12 years ago, and the sermon was called, One Out of One. Because one out of one of everybody that's ever heard a sermon of mine, one out of every one is going to die an earthly death. No exceptions. You're going to die. So let me ask you this, if it was today, did you do enough to prepare your children for heaven after you're gone, to instill in them the morals that they need to ensure that not only their lives are better, but God's kingdom is going to be more full, and that when you die, wherever you go, heaven or hell, you're not looking down or looking up going, and I should have done more. I should have started when they were little. And I should, should have put that God juice in them and told them what it was like to live this way, to live blessed. You know, it's called discipline your children. It's in the Bible multiple times. If you died today, have you instilled in your children enough about God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that you're and have planted the seed for their eternity? Because folks... As parents, that's up to you. It's not up to a babysitter. It's not up to a Sunday school teacher. It's not up to a school teacher. It's up to mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. It's not up to the neighbor. And I'll tell you something else. It's sure as heck not up to an iPad, an iPhone, a computer, or a television set. They are not going to find sanctification in those. So that's another big word. Sanctification, quintessentially correct. They are not going to find God. They are not going to find salvation in those, those computer things. They might find gratification in smiles, talking to their friends, doing things they shouldn't do, posting things they shouldn't post, and doing all those things. It's not going to get them to the kingdom of heaven. And if you're up there or down there, you're going to have to still eternally live with that consequences because your torment down there may be having to watch it. Now, I want you to think about hell for a minute. I don't want to talk about hell. I don't care. We're going to. There were two books of Revelation. One was John's and one was Peter's. John's Revelation is pretty graphic as to, to what's going to happen. They say that Peter's book of Revelation didn't get put in the canon, which is the, the, the books of the Bible, by Constantine, because it was too, it, it would affect too many people negatively. That's how the vision of hell Peter had. 
So when you look at those books, of, and Steve and I, Zarley talked about this, the books, the lost books of the Bible, one of them is that. Hell is this. If you're afraid of worms, you're going to get eaten by worms. If you're afraid of your spouse being with someone else, you're going to see her be with a thousand people or him. You're never going to sleep. You're going to be hot. You're going to be, the Bible says, you're going to be gnawed at, torn apart, grabbed, scared, live in darkness, be hot, and you're going to be tormented 24 hours a day forever. You will never see your loved ones that ever made it to heaven. But you'll have to think about them constantly because that's going to be a torture to you. If you didn't do something that could have saved your kids, that is going to be your torture in heaven. But see, here's the thing. That's not overnight. That's forever. Ever and ever. Look back 4,000 plus years when Abraham and them were walking the earth. If you read the Bible and you're one of the people like me, you can put yourself in what you read. It seems like yesterday that happened. It's over 4,000 years ago. You're going to have to live that every single day, nonstop, because, see, you don't sleep. All you do is get tormented. Now, on the other hand, if you can make it to heaven, it's the most joyful experience that you could ever have in your life, hugging your loved ones that have died that's made it. Knowing that you can be with our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that you can be with, with God, <clears throat> knowing that you can be with whoever you want, with knowing that, you know, Quinn and Jeremy and, and all them and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Bartholomew and, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, um, Boaz, Rachel, Mary's, all of them. You can go to Lazarus and say, what was it like to be dead those four days? What did you do? And then when did you come back? And see, you're going to have an audience with him, and he's going to tell you. Every question that you've ever had. And you're going to find out that Bigfoots really do exist. Uh-huh. That's heaven. How much better is that than the alternative? And all it takes, I'm telling you this, by show of hands, and I mean everybody out there and in here, by show of hands, who is willing to sacrifice for God to make sure that not only happens to you, but your family? Raise your hand. Amen. Give yourself a round of applause. I'm going to go to Psalms 9.1. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. See, the good news with that scripture, and Psalms is full of a lot of good scripture, man. It's always be thankful of the things you have and make sure that others know it's because of God. I have this because God allowed it. You know, we did a whole lot of stuff in Nashville. Um, well... I don't know what they did. I didn't, I didn't go with them. Yeah, you guys got all kinds of church pictures, but your pastor's not in a single one. Figure that one out. Not as a group. I was never invited. Everybody on the count of three go, oh, one, two, three. I was too busy. Um, I'm using this as an example. Here's this church in a very small town. It's a you know, it is what it is. Great things come in small packages. The blessings that have been stowed to millions of people out of this, this church have been enormous. The viewership and the people that we touch, and we know that we're touching people because of the emails and the messages that come through those systems. Because the people in India are contacting us. The people in Turkey are contacting us. The people in China, believe it or not, are contacting us. We've got them in Mexico. We've got them in Canada. We have them Germany. We have them all around the world. And that's not made up. That's a fact. This word about an almighty God has been touching more people 
than you ever could have imagined. And see, I look at that differently than you guys do, I guess. Because I look at that and I almost cry and I have cried over it. Because one thing, I don't deserve anything. And that's, the, that, that's an absolute fact. And if you know, if you talk to anybody that knows me, I get embarrassed about most of this stuff. Because if you wanted to put me out in the woods and give me a knife and give me a little bit of food and an ax and I'll come into civilization about once a month to gear up, I think I'd probably be okay with that. That's kind of me. So to be around all this stuff is actually, and I know you won't believe this, but it's actually overwhelming to me. But by God's grace, he did something really good for me. He gave me a little bit of uh, attitude and swagger. But the one thing I have that I've never lacked a day in my life, and I never will, is confidence. I believe in me. That's how the world changes. Believe in you. Believe in you. Cindy, believe in you. Teresa and Jeff, believe in you. Austin, believe in you. Rita, John, uh, John's daughter, believe in you. People in the back, believe in you. The people watching this right now, believe in you. Because I'm going to tell you something. When you start climbing the ladder of success, the number of people that want to believe in you dwindle. Because then they want to be you and they get jealous. Right? God doesn't have room in heaven for jealousy. He's got room in heaven for disciples. He's got room in hell, heaven for followers. Followers of a great king. And I said this all weekend and I'll say it now. God's still on the throne. Jesus is still on his right side sitting in that other big chair. Amen? And they're waiting for us to show up one day. So they're going to either kick us out or they're going to let us in. And that's up to you which one you get. You're either not going to make it or that's going to be the most glorious day of your life. So today, I want you to everybody, please just close your eyes right now. I want you to think about in the last week, how many blessings did somebody else give you? How many blessings did God allow somebody else to give you? And how many of those blessings did you just absolutely take for granted? How many of those blessings did you not thank God for? Because I'm telling you, if you didn't thank God for these blessings in the last, let's say, month, those blessings are going to stop. They just are. Because God is everything. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's the first. He's the last. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He is the maker of all. He's the one that will determine a blessing or a failure. He is the one that's going to determine how strong your grace gets by your prayer, by your dedication, by your love. He's the one that's going to determine whether you're going to be justified, sanctified, and crucified with an almighty God, Christ on a cross. But it starts with your prayer and your faith. What are you willing to do and give up for an almighty God? And are you thankful for everything that comes your way? Because if you are, Lord have mercy, Percy, the blessings are going to get bigger, bigger, and bigger. And that, my friends, is a fact jack. You could open your eyes now. <laughs> Hi, I hope nobody fell asleep. Psalms 95, 2, 3. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God and the king of all gods. There is only one God. He's the maker and the creator. There's one being that will control it all. And a lot of people in this church and a lot of people out there listening and a lot of people out there think that they can control other people and control other things. I got a news flash for you. Uh-uh. That's not how that works. The number one guy controls everything. He's number one. See, he's looking at me, probably laughing. Or he's just laughing. Probably because I did this. 
We have to absolutely always give thanks where thanks is due. Because if you don't, all those blessings go. You'll never get another opportunity. You'll never get another chance until you humble yourself on your knees to the Lord and you say, God, I took that for granted. Please give me another opportunity. I won't. I, I, won't, I won't do that. I saw a video of a guy that was begging Biden for more stimulus checks. And, and he said, I promise if you give me this stimulus check, I know it'll be the last one. And I won't go to the steakhouse this time. And I won't buy a more expensive car. And I won't buy my exotic animals that I bought. And I won't take my wife down to see the alligators down in Florida. And I'll do everything right if you give me another chance this time. Here's the thing. That's people's attitudes. I did this and messed it up. I wasn't thankful. But will you give me another chance? Man says no. God says, humble yourself to me. Make me smile like I've been preaching. Make me smile. And I'll give you every chance. Not only will I give you a chance, I will bless you, as the scripture I said before, exceedingly and abundantly above everything that you could ever imagine. That is a promise from God. And I got a praise report for you guys. Real quick, th this is God. My, man, I'll be nice. My mother-in-law, Joni, was told six, seven weeks ago, she had to be admitted into the hospital. She was urgent. Couldn't breathe, couldn't walk, dizzy, pressure in her chest. It was horrible. She gets there and they diagnose her. And they feed her a bunch of pills for congestive heart failure. And I told Joni, Joni, will you stand up? I know it's going to embarrass you, but will you? Please. Actually, come here. Come on. You wash your hands. <laughs> so I prayed, and I told Joni this. I said, Joni, it's a mistake. You don't have congestive heart failure. She goes back to the doctors. They tell her she does, and they have to be more tests and more pills. The doctor does an EKG, and they see a balloon in her chest, which means a clogged artery. Kelsey, I would have her to get up. She's man in the camera. Everybody out there say, hi, Kelsey Lane. Hey, wave your hand in front of the camera. Yeah, that's her. Um, so she goes and gets this EKG done, or whatever it is, and the image comes back with a bulge in the vein of her heart, which means a clogged artery. I'd already told Kelsey I prayed, and I felt like God said she's healed. Nothing wrong. Kelsey gives me, you got to know Kelsey and Cindy, they give me one of these. <laughs> I point blank, asked Bernie, I point blank looked at him, I said, the doctors are wrong. Didn't I, Bernie? I said, the doctors are wrong. So Thursday, she has to go in for a catheter to put stents in her heart for the clogged arteries. Not only did she not have clogged arteries, she doesn't have congestive heart failure. Now, other churches and other pastors can get up and say that, and then everybody will walk away and go, oh, praise God. Most people will go, yeah, right. So to anybody out there that wants it, and anybody in this church that wants it, Joni, if I ask for your medical report, could I have it? I'll give you the medical report to prove God lives inside this house. I want to repeat that. Ted coded at his house. Hosp well, at your house first, wasn't it? At the hospital. His wife calls me, come to the hospital. I go up there and I tell him, Ted, you're going to be fine. I go visit him. I say, you're going to be fine. Ted, how are you? Thank you. John, where's your cancer? Gone? Where's your heart disease? Gone. Huh. Wow. Don't tell me that God 
isn't still on his throne and thriving quintessentially in this church. These are reports that if anybody wants them, I will provide medical proof that God is here. Amen? I'm going to do one more, Austin. You guys, come on up. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 2.4. There we go. 2.14. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in, in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Him everywhere. Now the good news of that is one of the missions in, in life is to appeal or to spread the Word of God and help others see that there's glory in His name. I am going to end this today this way. Spread the glory in His name. God, again, is a jealous God. The Bible tells that. God is every emotion. God is joy. God is laughter. God is tears. God is fear. God is strength. God is all of it. So everybody with an addiction today, Stand up and be strong in yourself knowing that God's got you. Don't worry about what the guy down the street thinks because you're not going to be with him Friday at the bar. Worry about what he's going to think and how you're going to get up there one day to see him. Amen? Worry about how you're going to improve your family life by being clean and sober and a better person. And the people that say, oh, he or she's just a drunk in the town, just go like this to them. I know where I'm going. I quit and I got God. I know where I'm going. You just go about your bad self. Don't worry about it. Put a smile today. Put a smile on God's face. Give Him a covenant of love. Give Him that peace knowing that you have His attention. And then watch the blessings flow. And not only flow, Hey, I did it. <laughs> Flow rapidly. Watch the blessings become great. Or should I say quintessentially more than what you expect. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, on the count of three, everybody's going to say as loud as they can. One, two, three. You didn't know what you said. Half of you said cowboy up. And what the other half say? Yeah, do that again real loud. One, loud as you can. One, two, three. Cowboy!